Okay, well, it's a little after six and I think it's safe to get started. Folks will join us as they're able. Um, so I guess we'll just start with hello to everyone. Uh, my name is Jean Kolak, and I'm part of your hospital's community relations team. And I'd like to welcome all of you this Thursday evening to our community education webinar, Managing Mealtime with Your Picky Eater. We do know that this is a hot topic and it holds a lot of interest for you and for so many of our patients. And we're also very aware of how busy you are. So we're particularly pleased uh, that you managed to fit in the time tonight with what we hope will be a great start toward uh, healthy and enjoyable eating with your children. Um, now we have a few caregivers with us uh, this evening who are truly the experts you wanna hear from when it comes to kids and nutrition. And they'll be taking center stage in just a moment. But first I'd like to quickly review some of the housekeeping notes so that you'll all know what to expect with us this evening. Um, our presenters, our three presenters will speak for about 35 to 40 minutes. And then we'll be answering questions um, from all of you here tonight. So when it's time for Q&A or even before, uh, you'll need to know how to get your questions to them. Uh, I know that many of you have this down pat, but for those who are new to the Zoom webinar game, it's a little bit different than the typical Zoom meetings that you have at work or with friends and family. Uh, so for instance, today your audio has been automatically muted and that means you'll only see today's presenters and their slides. You won't see any other attendees and you won't be able to ask your questions verbally or in person. Um, so that was my long-winded way of saying, if you'd like to ask a question, please uh, click on the Q&A icon that's located at the bottom of your screen. Uh, we ask that you don't use the chat or raise hand icons as we won't be monitoring them. Uh, although we'll hold on answering the questions until the presentation has actually ended, you can certainly feel free uh, to type in your questions as you come up with them throughout the entire webinar. Uh, additionally, all of you were sent a worksheet earlier today via email. We thought that might be helpful for note taking this evening and to jog, jog your memory long after the presentation for uh, tips to help you as you enter the moment. Finally, a quick reminder that today's webinar is being recorded and it will be available on your hospital's YouTube channel within a few days. We'll also send you an email that contains a link to the video along with answers to any questions that may come in following tonight's webinar or any that we weren't able to answer today if time does become an issue. So just a reminder to submit a question after tonight, just email us at info at yourhospital.com. Uh, okay, so now that housekeeping duties are complete, let's move on to the reason we're all here tonight to help your picky eater thrive and everyone at your table to enjoy meal time or snack time again. So I am passing the Zoom square to Harriet San Clemente, longtime and well loved nurse practitioner at our own pediatric associates of York Hospital and the moderator of this evening's webinar. Good evening, everybody. I believe at about six o'clock, you may have just finished a dinner with your picky eater. So I'm anticipating you may have some very fresh questions on your mind. We're hoping that the, at the end, we have a lot of great discussion um, so that we can target the things you're most interested in. And I know in my practice every single day, I am addressing these kinds of questions. So that's why we chose this topic and invited the speakers that we have with us tonight. Next slide, please. So I've been a nurse practitioner for 38 years, a pediatric nurse for 45, I'm getting a little tired. <laughs> um, uh, we moved to the community of York about 11 years ago, and I absolutely love living where I work and getting to see all of you in Hannaford's and everywhere else I see you. I love spending time with my grandson, Charlie. That's him there in the picture. He's a great eater, by the way. And I love gardening. I admit that I am married to a picky eater. He was devastated to learn that corn wasn't a vegetable and he thinks broccolis are, are made of trees. I love to cook. He likes to eat if it's food he likes, but my best um, meal is eating out anytime. Next slide, please. Oh, hey, that's me. Um, Karen Mountjoy here. I'm a registered dietitian. I am a mom of three. Uh, my kiddos are 24, 20, and 17. 
Uh, but I remember those days of feeling uh, really pressured to be providing meals and snacks felt like all the time to my kids. They always wanted to eat. I have a private practice. I'm a small business owner. Um, I do love running. And uh, if you have any good book recommendations, feel free to drop those in the Q&A too, because I love to read. Um, before I was a dietitian, I was a special education teacher. And so for me, working with kids who are picky eaters, um, to me, that's like the perfect cross section, right? Sort of the Venn diagram, my all my background in child development and what I know about kids. And then what I know about nutrition, there's like this little cross section where they overlap. And those are my picky eaters. And I love the work that I do. Next slide, ready for Rebecca. Hi, um, I'm Rebecca Rafferty. I am an OT at York Hospital um, in our pediatrics department. Um, I grew up in New York, not in the city, but um, like the Catskill Mountains, Hudson Valley area. Um, I went to graduate school in New York and sought extra training and mentorship to further um, explore this specialty area of feeding. Um, my husband and I moved up to Maine, um, gosh, I guess like four or five years ago now. Um, this is our dog Hudson, who is in our photo. I do not have any children at the moment, but I myself am a picky eater. Um, so some of my favorite foods you may notice are maybe some of your own kids' favorite foods. Um, they're still my favorite foods. So my mom definitely had a hard time when I was younger trying to figure like, how do I get fruits and vegetables? How do I get this kid to eat these things? Or like, what do I do when she goes other places? So she may have had some of the same questions that you guys have, but it's okay. You still grow up to be, you know, happy, healthy adults. So here we are. Um, all right, next slide. So we have sent you guys out a worksheet. Um, if you didn't get it earlier, I believe there was also a link that was sent out so you can go ahead and download it. Um, but if you have it already printed out and available, it's gonna be a helpful guide for just kind of like keeping you on track throughout our presentation so you can jot down notes along the way. It'll kind of go in chronological order as we keep going. All right, next slide. So um, we're gonna cover three general signs of picky eating. There are a lot more than what we're gonna cover today, but when we were talking about putting this presentation together, we really wanted to um, highlight three that we thought were uh, ones that probably need a little further investigation, right? Um, and the first one that came to mind is something called food jagging. Uh, food jagging is when your kiddo will only eat a particular food over and over and over again. That kiddo will have peanut butter sandwich for breakfast every single day, every single day for months and months and months, and then Shazam, just stop. No more eating that. They'll have nothing with peanut butter, no more bread. And the reason for that is they kind of burn out on it, right? And so um, when we work with kiddos who do food jagging, one of the things Rebecca and I do is we help families figure out how not to let your kids saturate on a food. So that's one of our first signs. Uh, next slide. Um, if your kiddo is no longer interested in uh, trying new foods or, or looking at uh, a variety of foods or refusing foods that would be typically um, sort of the next developmental stage. And I think in this slide, we were thinking about kiddos who are, um, who are uh, toddlers and younger. I'm gonna move this so that I can see. Um, if a kiddo has um, maybe reached a certain age and they're not moving past um, purees, they're not interested in foods that are are, or they're rejecting foods that are lumpy or only wanting crunchy foods. Um, that's something we would want to look a little closer at and see what's, what's happening there. Next slide. Um, sometimes kiddos that we see have a very, very limited diet. Um, they only eat maybe six different foods. Um, they refuse quite, uh, strongly to even try branching out into any other foods. 
Um, we often see kiddos who have um, a real aversion to foods that are a little more difficult to eat. Um, kiddos might refuse to eat an entire food, um, a food category like meats, um, fruits with peels and vegetables, those harder to eat foods, those fibrous foods. Um, when your kiddo, if, if that sort of a, uh, describes your kiddo, then we would wanna look closer at that for sure. Next slide. All right, so that kind of leads us to, you know, when do you reach out? You know, um, what, so we're gonna go through a couple of different um, kind of like signs or like flags, if you will, as to like maybe a, a time that you should reach out. So if it's starting to impact your family meal times or your family routines, you're kind of finding yourself in a situation where you're like, oh gosh, it's the holidays, but I don't know how we're gonna go to like Aunt Sally's house because we can't go there for dinner. My kid's not gonna eat anything. Now I need to make food at home before we go or pack them something. And I have to explain to the family why they're eating something different or maybe your kid's a little bit older and they're, they don't, they don't want to go over to their friend's house for dinner, or they don't want to go to the pizza party birthday because what are they going to eat? And now they're, you know, it's impacting their ability to socialize or it's impacting your family's ability to go out and do things or to go out to a restaurant or go out different places. It's, it's impacting, you know, your daily life. It's a, it's a great time to reach out. Um, so next slide. Oh, that's, excuse me, that's me and Harriet. So um, one of the things that um, parents often tell me is that their primary care provider has encouraged them to reach out to me to figure out why it is um, their kiddo is such a selective eater. And so that it's, it's actually affecting their growth, right? They're not, they're either, um, their growth percentile is, is falling or um, in some cases, their growth percentile is increasing, right? So if there's something that's making it um, so that your kiddo's um, growth is not um, along the same path that we had seen previously. Um, Harriet, do you have anything else to add to that? No, I, I basically, I, I think that everybody knows when their child comes in for a well child visit or actually any visit, we're monitoring their growth parameters, their weight, their height, um, their vital signs. And we're very uh, much interested in what they like to eat, what the, the family meals are like. Um, and, you know, everybody's journey with food is unique. And so it's really important to kind of learn more about the child within the family because it's a system. It's not the child's problem. It's a, a group issue. And that doesn't mean that a, please don't take that to mean that the parent is at all at fault. This is just something that if one person is struggling, it affects everybody in the system. So um, yeah, when I talk to people and I can see that there's stress amongst the parent about how difficult it is to feed their child. And then in addition, if we see concerns about the growth and development, then of course we're gonna be very concerned and we're gonna to wanna to involve everybody that we can. Next slide, please. All right, so another great reason to reach out is if your parent that tells you something's not right. So if you, you know, you know your child best, you've had those conversations with your primary care, or you've had those conversations with friends, family, but you know, if you still feel like there's something that's just not quite right, that's a great time to reach out. Um, because just because it's working doesn't necessarily mean it's functional. So maybe your kid, you know, is meeting all of the growth curves or is, you know, able to do all of those things, but you're still not seeing it work for your family, you know, that that functionality is really a piece that we want to make sure that you guys have as well. So Rebecca, can, can I add to that? Would it be yeah. all right? Oh yeah. So quite often um, parents will come to me and they and they say, well look, my kiddo is on their growth curve. They're they're, you know, they're growing right. They're, they're sort of like their little dots are lining up on that growth chart the way they should. But really, the quality of their life is not that great, right? And so when I do a nutrition analysis and I look and I go, yeah, they're meeting their calorie needs where they're, they're meeting these other sort of like key nutrient needs. And it's not quite working, like you said. Right. I think we're ready for the next slide. 
oh, so it's me. How can a nutritionist and an OT collaborate to help my family? I get that question a lot. People think, well, how do we, like how do Rebecca and I um, put our heads together to help you? Um, I'm, as the nutritionist, I'm always interested in your kid's growth and I'm interested in um, your, your kid's nutrition status. So one of the things that I recommend to families, if it's needed, is I recommend um, supplements. And I don't, I don't have sort of a blanket, you know, routine that I give to families. We look to see what's missing and we look to see what, um, uh, what we can do about it with food first and then maybe some supplements. Um, another thing what I do with families is um, the biggest question I get is, okay, great. So you want me to have my kiddo, you know, join us for dinner and to have the same food everyone else is eating. How do I do that? Please help me plan my meals so that it works for the whole family. And one of the phrases that I often use is consider it without catering. And that phrase comes from um, this idea that as the person who's creating a meal for everyone, you're not creating separate meals for everyone sort of who comes to the dinner table. You're creating one meal, you're serving one meal with multiple pieces. You're being considerate about people's preferences or your picky eater, but you're not catering to them. I also call it short order cooking, right? You're not making everybody else gets chicken pot pie and your picky eater gets a grilled cheese sandwich. I can help families do, you know, figure out how to do that. Um, another question I get all the time is snacks. How do we feed my kiddo snacks? Um, they are crazy for goldfish or pirate booty. I need some more snack ideas. And I also encourage families to cook together and I give them resources to do that. And we talk about how that can happen. Um, there's a collaboration with Rebecca and I um, she works on her OT stuff, and then I join in and we talk about how uh, Rebecca can help kiddos develop the skills they need to um, be able to eat some of these foods that we want that have uh, certain nutrition in them. Next slide. Okay, we can kind of get into that's how nutrition can help and be that side of it, and this is how OT can help. Um, so one of the first things we can do is, well, caring can help you set up like that actual meal. Like what is that meal going to be that you can serve your family? We can work on what is your mealtime routine and how does that work for your child and your family? Like, is it that your family all eats together at the same time at the dinner table or that the kids help set the table or, you know, how is everyone kind of coming together to make mealtime work? Or is it that your family is kind of like, we're on the go, we need to be able to move, or we don't have a big family table that we all eat at, but we do all, you know, join together at like the coffee table and watch a show together. Whatever it might be that works for your family, how do we make it so that that mealtime routine is working for your family? Or how can we modify it so it works better for you guys? Um, another aspect is addressing the child's sensory needs. Um, we can do this through education and facilitation. So we do a lot of sensory-based strategies um, prior and during the meal times, which are things that you guys can learn in sessions and um, some of the things that we provide some education about. Um, so if you think about it, when you start introducing a food, there's so many different sensory components to a piece of food at all. What does it smell like? What does it taste like? What does it feel like? You've got, what does it look like? Um, so if something has like a really big smell, you know, that might be the thing that is creating that barrier for your child. How do we work on that? How do we desensitize, not to the point where they don't smell it, but so that it isn't that big, like, oh, so jolting to their system that they're like, mm -mm, not doing it, not going to be in the same room. It can't be in the house. How do we kind of move past that? And it's a slow build of, you know, introducing it to their system so that their system can handle it. So really working with their sensory needs and kind of building in what's appropriate for them. Um, I can work on increasing the number of foods that they tolerate. So maybe some families come to me and they're like, okay, well, they only tolerate six foods. Um, or maybe we've got a list of 15, but they're not all, you know, quote unquote, healthy foods. 
I'm not necessarily concerned about the food's nutrition. I'm concerned about how do we expand the number of foods that they eat. So can we go from like a crunchy Cheeto? Can we also do Cheeto puffs? Can we also do veggie straws? Like what are some other things? Now those aren't necessarily the things high in nutrition that Karen's looking for kids to get to, but can we slowly increase those number of foods so that we're, you know, it's a slow process. It's not, okay, great, they ate this. Now they're gonna eat a carrot stick straight out of the garden. Like it's, it's gonna be a build, um, kind of building up those different textures. So that's one of the things. Another thing is building tolerance for age appropriate serving sizes. So sometimes families will come and they'll be like, okay, well, they'll eat a vegetable, but they'll only eat two peas. They certainly won't eat a whole entire scoop. Or how can we build upon that and get them to a point where, you know, I don't necessarily know the exact how many peas they should be eating, but that's where Karen could come in and be like, hey, from a nutrition standpoint, this is what I'd like them to get to, or this is our goal. Okay, I can help you get there and we can progress through it. But I'm not the person with the necessarily, I don't, I don't know the nutrition content of the peas, exactly how many we should be eating. <laughs> I often say that I call myself the way and the what lady. I want to know what your kiddo weighs and I want to know what they're eating, that growth and that nutrition piece. And my OT partner is the how person. I'm the what and the way. Rebecca's about the how. And there's lots of overlap between what we do. And I do want to say that it's really interesting to me. So often people go, well, my kiddo eats this. I know it's not really healthy, but they eat this. Um, this kind of Cheeto, and now they're eating this kind of Cheeto. That's a win. That's yeah. a total win. And I want you to know, I'm not the food police. I am not going to say, yes, Cheeto, no to this kind of Cheeto. There's um, there's a, a, a level of comfort we're trying to get to with kids. There's a level of trust. We want kids to trust themselves and we want them to trust Rebecca and we want them to trust their family. So um, there's, a, there's a very slow progression between, and I think Rebecca is going to hit this on the next slide, when you start with one food and how you kind of slowly, slowly inch toward um, the uh, quote unquote healthier food that we're trying to get to. So I think we're ready for the next slide. We are ready for the next slide. All right. So what Karen just kind of hinted at there is what we call food chaining. Um, so here's an example that I kind of put up for you guys. So we start off with that classic Cheeto puff or like the cheese ball kind of, it's puffy, it kind of melts on your mouth, melts in your mouth, it's got that cheesy flavor. But I have parents that come in and they're like, my kid will only eat this one specific brand of this one specific puffy Cheeto. Okay, well, can we maybe get to a different brand of that type of puffy Cheeto? And we'll start there. Can we just explore different brands? Because they all taste a little bit different. Um, once we get past that, you can start working on different things to kind of progress yourself forward. One of the biggest things with food chaining is that you want to think about those sensory components. You don't, you only want to change one at a time. So if you look across this slide, every single one of these foods is orange. Every single one of these foods is crunchy. Like, we're not changing a ton about it. A lot of these things you might look at and go, they all, they all pretty much look the same. <laughs> what are we doing here? But you're going from that crunchy, puffy Cheeto that's gonna melt in your mouth to that crunchy Cheeto that it doesn't have that same melt in your mouth feeling. You have to crunch it a little bit more to that. Um, the next one there is an orange veggie straw. Now that doesn't mean that we're going to give them a bag of veggie straws. I'm, I very specifically in my session going to pick out all of the orange veggie straws and we're going to work on orange veggie straws next because it is the same color. We're not changing a ton. Here we're changing the flavor component. The flavor is changing, um, but you still have that crunch. You still have that long shape. You still have, it feels similar in your hand. It's got that same crunch in your mouth. So all of those other senses are saying, oh, okay, this is similar to something I know, but it's a new taste. So that's what we're exploring in this one. The next one, um, this is a very specific brand of carrot sticks that Rhythm brand makes some dehydrated, crunchy um, vegetables and fruits that are just truly the vegetable in a dehydrated form. So it gives you that crunch piece. So now you're going from that veggie straw, which is that same orange stick 
to a carrot stick, but it's dehydrated and it's crunchy and it's the same shape and it's the same color. It, look, it looks similar to a veggie straw. It's got the smell of a carrot. It has the taste of a carrot. It is a carrot, but it's got that crunch and that shape and that similarity that we've been following along the line here which makes it easier on the sensory system to tolerate that progression. And then from there, once we've got that, you could move to perhaps like a baby carrot sliced into thin matchsticks. So you don't wanna go from something that's thin and long to just like, here's a carrot. So we still wanna keep that consistency of, you know, it takes a little extra time to prep and chop carrots down. But at the end of the day, it's gonna go that extra mile to help getting those carrots in. Um, and then once we kind of get to this point, maybe then we can add some flavors or something to make it a little bit more enjoyable. Maybe they're a kid that really likes dip. Maybe we get some ranch out or some hummus or maybe even some chocolate hummus. Um, I had a kid today who was working on something very similar to this progression. And he had the rhythm carrot sticks that he brought in and he had some chocolate hummus and he was like, he had no interest in wanting to do those carrot sticks. They had the word carrot. They looked like a carrot, smelled like a carrot. It must be a carrot. He wasn't interested. But we added some chocolate hummus to it. And he's like, you know, not bad. And it might have been a tablespoon of hummus on a little piece of carrot, but he ate the carrot. So you can always work on a lot of dip with your little piece of, you know, that food that you're looking to get to or any of them along the way. But it's still going to help you make that progress towards where you're going. You can always decrease the amount of dip that you use at the end. Dip um, is dip is a great strategy. Yeah. I think that that is spectacular. And chocolate hummus. Delicious. I mean, it's, I don't want to list off all the nutrition in there, but it's good stuff, right? And you can also buy those little matchstick um, carrots already in that shape in a right, bag right. in the grocery store. So I love that. All right, so that is the end for that slide there. On your handout, you'll see that there was a space for you guys to input this food chain example that we had on our slide deck. There's also a space for you guys to try it out on your own. So I'd encourage you to try to think about what your kids are eating or try to think about your picky eater. What is that food that they are always going to? And how do you think you could try to train it along to get to something that is closer to where you want it to be. Now, if your kid is only tolerating Cheerios and you want them to get to tomatoes, like it's, it's a big leap. You, it might be that you food chain five things to get closer and then that becomes your starting point. And then you chain a little bit more and that one becomes your starting point and you eventually get there. It really depends on how fast your child is is willing to progress or their sensory system is willing to allow them to progress. So that's where our, our sensory prep from an OT perspective can come in and we can work on like, how can we prep before or during or after meals to get their body ready to accept these different sensory experiences um, for meal times. But if you guys have any questions about that too, feel free to put it in the question and answer. Or maybe you're like, I've started my food chain example on my worksheet. I've gotten through two of them. Do you have any thoughts as to where I could go from here? That's a great question. We'd be happy to field it. Anybody has one? But next slide. So how do you get from sitting at home, being frustrated with your child and their refusal to eat foods to getting the help that Karen and Rebecca have to offer? I first of all would like to say that it, having the approach of a team is critical and um, they each bring their expertise because every child has a different starting place with this. And many of these kids have underlying issues as well. So for, in, for instance, it's a child with poorly controlled ADHD can't even sit long enough at the table to eat anything. They, they just can't. So when you come to see your pediatrician, your pediatric provider, that is why I recommend starting there because those are things that we can help with. There are lots of ideas of how to get a child to sit still, maybe stand for meals, but the, the, the thought is 
to meet that child where they are at the time and build on the skills, which is a lot of what Rebecca was saying. Um, a child who has autism is going to have sensory issues. A child who has developmental delays could very well have mechanical issues as well as sensory issues. Infants who uh, were born prematurely who had nasogastric tubes for feeding are going to oftentimes have um, difficulty tolerating foods and maybe even developing swallows. So many times we not only involve um, OT and nutrition, but will involve specialists from uh, speech therapy because they can help with the issues around um, coordination, coordination of swallowing um, and uh, making sure the child can tolerate things that have more texture without uh, choking and things like that. And some children even have trouble tolerating liquids. So again, it depends on that child's specific um, backstory. And um, what's really wonderful about Karen as a nutritionist is that she mentioned to you in the beginning that she has the special education background. And that is truly unique. We are so lucky to have her available to our patients because this, you know, I, I very often sit with families and try to brainstorm, like, what can we do? Because I know that the parents angst is all around making sure their child is healthy and going to stay healthy and get enough vitamins and proteins and all those things we talk about in pediatric visits. But just having someone who can look objectively at the family, which is what both um, Rebecca and Karen can do, and think like, what what's happening at a meal? What's happening around food? Um, and you know, then considering to the normal developmental challenges. So your toddler is not going to sit there and have a lovely half hour family meal. Sorry, it's not going to happen, even if they're at grandmother's for Christmas. So it, you. Again, you need to kind of think about what's happening, and there's just so many factors to work on, and these are wonderful um, resources that we have to begin that. And then lastly, uh, I think that it's important for parents to kind of think about their own eating issues. Um, it's really hard if you are a parent preparing meals and you hate vegetables. You're probably not going to be thinking about preparing them on a regular basis. So maybe as a parent, there's some work that each of us need to do um, to help sort of provide for the best nutrition for our family. And that doesn't have to look like, you know, the same for every family. Um, there's lots of ways to meet the basic nutritional needs. And that's something where Karen can help with that. Um, so again, what you do is you start with your pediatric provider. You come in and we start the conversation. We start to peel away the pieces of the onion and figure out what's going on here. And then we start to help to make a treatment plan and pull in the resources that we need, which would be um, nutritionists and occupational therapy, sometimes speech therapy. And it may go beyond that too, depending on what your child needs. But um, I think this is, if you sort of wondering where to start, this is the best place to, to start. Next slide, please. Okay, so. Hopefully, after what we've had to say, we have some questions. I see a couple on the screen. Um, so I think that uh, Jean is going to pick that up. Sure. Happy to read the first two questions. They're related, so I'll ask them both at the same time. What do you do when food chaining if the child doesn't like one of the items in the chain? For instance, if they get to the orange veggie straw, but don't like the rhythm carrot stick, do you go backwards and stay on the veggie straw for a while longer? That's the first question. Yeah. On the same topic, how long do you wait to jump to the next food? For instance, Cheeto puffs every day for five days and then move to the crunchy Cheeto for five days, et cetera? Okay. I'm happy to field this one first. Um, it's it's a hard question to answer because there isn't a protocol. It's not like, okay, we're going to stick with this for five days and then we're going to move to this next one for five days. You kind of work with your kid where they're at. Um, so I try to think about like, okay, what might be something that's similar enough for that child? And what is your end goal? 
So if your end goal is that carrot stick, maybe maybe there's something for you that's in between that orange veggie straw and that and that rhythm carrot stick. Maybe maybe your food training isn't five, maybe it's ten, maybe it's twenty before you get to that carrot stick. So everything's a little bit different. Some kids can tolerate that sensory change for it to be, you know, bigger than others. So maybe there's something that just has to go in between. And maybe that's something that, you know, that um, those weekly sessions with like your OT or with your nutritionist, where you guys can help problem solve those things. Um, I do a lot of food training like in our sessions and I'll say, okay, we worked on this food today. I want you guys to practice that this week. And then next week we'll try to incorporate this next food. And if we don't get to incorporating that next food, we work on the steps to get there. So I'm not expecting that that child has, you know, a bag of cheese puffs and then the next day they can do a bag of Cheetos and the next day they can do a bag of, or a serving of. I'm, I'm going, okay, we have one Cheeto puff in front of us. Can we make it through the different stages with that? Like, can we, can we look at it? Can we talk about what it feels like? Can we talk about what it, you know, if I touch it to my lips, what does it feel like? If I touch it to my tongue, what is it, what does it taste like? Does it leave anything on my tongue? You know, can I put it in my mouth but not make it touch anything? Like I we're really lowering that expectation on the child and not saying, here, just try it. We're kind of introducing it slowly to each sensory system and kind of breaking it down that way. So the whole entire end of it, I think usually when I go through it with kids, it's like eight steps. And at the end, like the seventh one is putting bite marks in it. I want to see, can you leave teeth marks in it? Or does it crack? You don't need to keep it in your mouth. If it cracks, you can put all the pieces on the table, put all of them back on your plate, whatever, that's fine. But I want to know, does it leave the teeth marks or does it crack in half? Like we're, we're being food scientists. We, I'm collecting data for research. And then, you know, the last step might be taking a bite. I'm not expecting that that bite has to be swallowed, but can they take a bite? Can they chew it twice? Can we slowly start to tolerate in our mouth and tolerate those pieces and then kind of moving forward from there? So it really all depends on where your child is and how ready they are to move on. When I find a kiddo um, is in my office and we've done some food chaining um, and the parent says to me, holy smokes, I cannot believe that you got them to interact, take a bite of, and actually chew and swallow this thing, which is so different from what, you know, we had at home. I'm going to use, for example, I have a kiddo um, who uh, would only eat the Hannaford's white cheddar cheese that comes like in little slices, right? Looks like a little stick of butter, right? They slice, they're all sliced up. And he would only eat the small ones. And mom said, no, don't even try anything different. And I went, well, that's my job. So we're going to try something different. And I bought the next time I bought um, the big slices of cheddar, you know, in the packet. And I put it down in front of him. And he said, what's that? And he was really like agitated. And I said, well, let's learn about it. Let's figure it out. And as soon as he, he was like, that's cheese. And he ate it. And it, that was the end of that. And I turned to mom and I said, don't be buying the little cheese anymore. Now you need to have both of those cheeses at home. So to answer that question, you know, how long do you um, stick with one step and then move to the next step? I encourage families when we have some success um, in our sessions to make sure that you're carrying that over at home, that you're that you're doing it too, just to just to let you know, I have now got this kid with a block of cheese, and he will cut it with a cheese cutter into strips and then devour them. I'm gonna blow his mind next week because I'm gonna bring him orange cheese. We'll see how that goes. <laughs> But it's all cheese, right? It's 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 the same thing that you were doing with your cheese puffs, mm -hmm. but we're just trying to get him to be a little more flexible and open really to some of those changes. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Next question. 
I missed the first 15 minutes. Will there be a handout or a link for the recorded version? Yes, indeed. There will be a link sent to you via email in a few days once the session gets put up on our YouTube channel. Um, also asked was, I am, did I just miss that? I'm sorry, just one moment, please. I am interested in knowing when I should reach out, not just with my gut feeling. So I think to answer that question, um, I'm going to go back to uh, a couple of slides that we talked about, or rather just reference back to a couple of slides that we talked about, definitely if your kiddo's um, growth is being affected. And also, I think Rebecca talked about um, specifically when you're thinking about um, your the quality of life for your family, if you're not able to go to someone's, if you're panicked, oh my gosh, Thanksgiving is coming up and it's going to be so challenging because they're not going to eat any of those foods you only see once a year, right? And what if what if your kiddo is a little bit older and they won't go on sleepovers because they don't want to eat at somebody else's house? Or um, you're having challenges, even just packing their lunch. My kiddo will only eat ravioli hot from the microwave. I That's all they have for lunch. And I don't, and I don't know how to pack a lunch for them for school. I think, um, when uh, there are issues that are making feeding your kiddo challenging, I think that's just grounds enough for reaching out and starting the conversation with Harriet. I would also add, um, I think what you just said is perfect, but I think that I would add when you feel stressed as a parent and you feel like you're not doing what you need to do for your child and you're worried about their nutritional status, that's when you come and you talk to us. I find many times that it it gets doesn't get brought up until uh, the well child visit occurs and it's something that we normally talk about. Um, but I find that many times parents have been sort of struggling with this for a while. Um, and, you know, again, I think I said in the beginning, feeling guilty, feeling stressed, and there's no need for that. I mean, this is your child is who your child is, and we're going to try to figure this out step by step. And we're all together as a team going to make sure nutritionally that they're doing well. Um, and if we talk about some of the ways that you're feeding your child, and we may have suggestions, it's not judgment, it's just trying to give you alternative ideas. And um, one question that I'll, I'll add right here for both of you is, I am commonly asked and told that uh, families are feeding their children from pouches. And that's become a bigger and bigger um, way of feeding children. And every time I talk to a family, I find out that there's several more things thrown into that pouch. So I've, I've gone to the store and I've looked at the pouches and I've looked at the ingredients and they are very diverse in how they're made. And some of them are loaded with sugar. Some of them have as much as six teaspoons of sugar. And look at the size of that pouch. That's half of the pouch. Um, so no wonder kids like that. But, you know, I, I so I have two concerns when for the two of you. One is, I'm very concerned that the child is only experiencing drinking their meals. And so they're not being exposed to or, or the food chain, like you're trying to describe. And so does that promote their uh, further rejection of foods down the line? And two, how do we help parents to, to look at the nutritional value of what's in that pouch, not just, you know, what the child really loves because it's full of sugar? I'm going to let Rebecca answer that first, but I have, I have, I have thoughts about pouches, but I'm going to let Rebecca talk about that first. Okay. So I'm going to go off of my, from a nutrition standpoint, that's all Karen, because the kid's eating. So we've got a new food if we've got a new pouch. One of the things that I like to look at is, okay, are we only exclusively eating out of pouches though? Like, are we able to use a spoon? Can we tolerate that same pouch? Okay. That's the one pouch from that one brand. And that's one of the two flavors that we've got. Great, we're gonna make it look a little different. Let's put it in a bowl, give them a spoon. Let's try it and we're gonna dip a pretzel in it. We're gonna dip an animal cracker in it and our animal's gonna go swimming. 
how can we introduce some other things and use it as a tool rather than our only thing that we have? How can we expand it a little bit? I'll let Karen speak on the other part. <laughs> well, you know, it's, um, it's, uh, I feel like um, Harriet kind of hit, you know, hit on one of my points when she said, is this the only way the kiddo is eating? And are they developing skills that they need to eat, right? So if they're only eating, you know, squeezing that pouch and it's just going in their mouth, this is, this is a, a, a speech pathologist or, or Rebecca's, um, you know, laying a little bit, but from a nutrition perspective, if it's in a pouch, the kiddos don't smell it. They don't um, touch it with their hands. If the pouch has um, apples and strawberries in it, there might be a picture of the apples and strawberries on the outside, maybe. But that's not what apples and strawberries are like. And I, those pouches are massively convenient, super convenient. And if you're a parent on the go, those totally work. And if that's one of the ways your kiddo gets food, or if it's one of the ways your kiddo gets fruits and vegetables, I'm like, that's great. That's good. We're checking off the box for getting some nutrition. Although I will say that most of those pouches, the first ingredient probably is apples and applesauce. So it might be. 95% applesauce with a little bit of strawberry puree on top. So your kiddo's not getting the diversity really that they need to. And they're not learning how to chew an apple, chew a strawberry. And, and um, they're, not they're not learning, you know, what the whole food looks like. So um, super convenient, but not really what we want for our kids all the time. Right. It, it does. Um like from an oral motor perspective. So all of the muscles that kind of go into being able to move things around in your mouth and chew and all of that kind of those patterns, the things that you need to chew on an apple slice. Now, yes, some kids that are young enough to have like an apple puree are not truly ready for an apple slice or hand them a whole <laughs> apple, but there are other ways that we can go about it. How can we do like a cooked apple or like a something else? There's different stages to being able to get there. Well, they are convenient, they're super handy. They are super helpful in certain situations. They're just not the end all be all only way to get fruits and vegetables into your kid. But yeah. Okay. I'm going, I'm just going to point out that it's about 10 minutes of seven and we have a number more, we have eight questions still. So um, we might want to try to answer them just a little bit more quickly. Um, okay, what is considered limited eating? How many foods or types of foods? I will start on this one. Um, I think it varies depending on the kid. And I know that that's not a super helpful answer. I've had families that come in where their kid has four foods, six foods. I would encourage you to try to reach out before that. I, you know, I've also had families, I think I, had an eval a few weeks ago where the parent came in and said like look my kid's really picky and then they gave me a list of like 20 different foods or 25 foods and there were some fruits on there there were some veggies on there there's a little bit of everything but it's still hard for their family and that doesn't make it that that's still hard for them and that's a-okay that's still a good time to reach out you don't have to feel like you're drowning to reach out like you can just feel like it's inconvenient or it's not working for your family. And I'd encourage you to reach out then and not feel like you're on a sinking ship alone. And I'm, not when your kid only has three foods left. I'm so sorry to interrupt, Rebecca. No, go for it. I think that if your kiddo's list of accepted foods is so limited that you are repeating foods, um, you can't put together a uh, sort of a balanced meal, if you will a fruit or sorry, a fruit or veggie, a protein and a starch. If you don't have enough that you can't mix that up, you know, every couple of days, that's limited, right? We really want, we want that variety. So if you're not able to pull off a balanced meal, that's, that's, that's a limited diet. Okay. What are suggestions to getting supplements into a child that will notice powder in water, which is all they drink, and avoid gummy vitamins? 
Um, I so I don't know what the powder is that they're trying to put in the water, but um, there are different types of um, there are supplements that are liquid that can be mixed into some things. And so I often suggest that for families. Um, it's not I usually don't recommend gummies because they look like candy and I don't want to trick kids into that. And also they're not great for your teeth. So and then, I guess another format. Karen, can the liquid kind of thing, can it be mixed into like a juice or water? Could it be mixed into like a smoothie? It um, could, I just, I don't know how it holds up in those different scenarios, but I'm curious is, if you have different it does not hold up in water. Um, it would definitely hold up in a smoothie or a pouch if you squeeze the pouch into the bowl or some yogurt. Um, I guess it depends on what kind of supplement it is. If it's just a multivitamin, I guess that would be okay. Uh, I, get, I guess I would add that maybe you want to check in with your pediatric provider as to what you're supplementing with. Mm -hmm. We don't generally recommend a lot of supplements, maybe a multivitamin if we think that's necessary, but I would check in because there are a million products out on the market and they uh, it doesn't matter how they market them. They're just trying to get you to buy their products. So bring the product in to the pediatrician with you and, and let us take a look at it. Let us read the ingredients and let us try to decide, is this really going to help your child? Um, is it a good interim step because things are so limited or, you know, just start to brainstorm. But I, I would, it's not something we normally recommend. Harriet, that's a really great point. Awesome. Okay. Could my nine-year-old watch this video so that we can decide together what our next step is? And should the child know about the food chaining? I'm going to say yes. I, I, so I, Absolutely. I, I don't try to hide things from the kid during the session. So when we're trying to food chain and move from deli turkey to roasted turkey to rotisserie turkey to I don't try to tell them, oh, it's just the same chicken you've been eating at home. Mm -hmm. I don't try to slip salmon into a sandwich and tell you ah, it's just chicken. Like we, I, I am open and honest with them and they are you know, with me every step of the way. And if, and if we're just at that stage where we can tolerate it being on the table with us, then that's where we are today. And we're going to tolerate looking at it at the table and we're going to try to explore it a little bit more. How can we use a fork and explore it? Take a look at it. What can you tell me about it? And we're going to keep progressing that way. And yeah. if your nine-year-old wants to sit and watch the video on, on the recording, Go for it. Um, yeah. Yeah. Okay. My little guy tends to tends to gag when he does try a new food, and then that gives him anxiety, and he doesn't want to try it again. How do I convince him to try it again? Mm -hmm. oh, Rebecca, that's all you. Mm -hmm. So okay. Um, yeah, that's tricky. That's a hard a hard place to be. Um, but that's where I would probably go back a little bit. I'm not going to ask him to jump right back into a bite. How can we explore that food in a safe way? How can we, you know, tolerate it at the table again? How can we slowly work our way back up to it so that he becomes or she becomes more comfortable with that food so we can get there? Also, another thing that I want to explore in that is if they're just gagging with the food, I'm wondering, are we getting it in? Are we trying to chew it and we're gagging on the way down? Is it a we can't chew it and, and swallow um, question. Is it that we don't have the skills or the strength for that? Is it a sensory piece where that smell or that feel in our mouth is causing our sensory system to kind of like, oh, can't do this anymore. So there's so many different components that could be involved in that gag reflex that you're seeing. Um, but it's something to certainly explore. Mm -hmm. Okay. If my child's weight and height are on track and the doctor is not concerned about their growth, how do I address my concerns with the number of foods they eat and variety? How do I convince the doctor to refer us to, to a nutritionist? I've been told by the doctor that my child is fine and it's normal for his age group to be picky. Well, if you were to come to see me and you presented those concerns to me, you're the parent. You have so much intuition you know your child better than any of us so if you see something going on at home and you really concerned 
there's no harm in in inviting others into uh, think about you know what is going on and and maybe it's just a matter of you need some reassurance that everything is okay but maybe there is something to be dealt with so I, I would say maybe reach out to someone else if they really don't want to uh, engage in any kind of conversation I would also point out um, uh, for nutrition services you don't always need a referral mm -hmm. Not always. So mm -hmm. sometimes you can self-refer. Um, it depends on your insurance plan and it depends on what state you live in. So, but I do know that OTs do need an o do need a referral. So if you were just looking maybe for um, some reassurance, like uh, Harriet said, and you wanted to reach out to a dietitian, um, you don't always need a referral. Like it would depend on your plan. You could sort of circumnavigate. Yourself. Okay. Regarding supplements, my guy won't take vitamins. Karen suggested a liquid one for us, but he absolutely won't take it after throwing up for the first time. He won't do chewables or gummies either. I read about this powder called Enof, E-N-O-F, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing it right, that you can blend into food. Do you think that's okay? Um, I heard my name, so I'm assuming this question is for me. Um, I don't know. I don't know that. I don't know that um, supplement. So I would need to look into it. But if you and I know one another, send me a message tomorrow. We'll, we'll look at it. Okay. Okay. My daughter refuses to eat bread. She will eat pasta, but refuses bread of any kind, rolls, toast, any sort of sandwich, etc. Any suggestions on strategies for adding this? Hmm. So cracker, so I guess I have questions. I would have a lot of questions I would need to ask before I could go anywhere with that. I wonder about, I don't know, Rebecca? Okay, so I also would have a lot of questions. That's like one of those great things that I would love to hear in like a, in a in an eval. So we could try to problem solve it together because sometimes it, it's then, okay, well, what are the other foods that they do tolerate? What are the other foods that we aren't tolerating? And can I help you find a pattern there? Is it the texture? Is it the way that it's managed? Is it the way it's sticky in your mouth? Um, there's so many different components that could be the reason behind the no bread stance. Um, it's great that we have pasta and we have other starches and things like that that you guys can rely on to help balance out those meals, but I can get that not having bread is tricky. Um, sometimes I'll start with those kids if you're really into like a sandwich or something like that, doing like little roll ups. Um, do they have taco shells? Like, can you, is that something that's, you know, useful for you guys to start with or lean towards? Um, and they make those in all sorts of different sizes. You can get the itty bitty teeny tiny ones all the way up to those great big giant burrito sized. So I like Karen said, I think there's a lot more questions that I would have to help you guys answer through that. So I hope some yeah. of this will be helpful. I think about, I think about crackers, Stacy's pita chips, um, pretzels. Like I, I guess I'm, I have like, I have questions. <laughs> I can't I answer that one. More. <laughs> yeah. Okay, then on to the next. I hear many parents say, if the kid doesn't eat what's on the table, they don't eat that night. No snacks later, they go to bed hungry. Um, eventually they'll learn to eat. I can't let my kids go to bed hungry. It just doesn't feel right. What's the right approach to that? Just making sure there's food you know they'll eat at mealtime, offer a healthy snack later before bed. I'm gonna jump in and start if that's okay. Yeah. Um, I feel like there's no right answer, like quote unquote, right answer. Like you need to do what's best for your family. At the end of the day, your kid needs food. They need nutrition. They need sustenance to be able to continue to grow and develop. If that looks like a peanut butter sandwich, if that looks like a bowl of cereal, if that looks like something else on the table, because you're willing to make it and they explored a food that you guys had at the table for dinner that night, I, you know, you have to do what you have to do to make sure that your family is healthy and happy and fed and continues to grow and thrive. Um, I also wanna offer that it's not an innate thing for people to want to eat. I have heard that as well. And like, oh, well, they'll eat if they're hungry. If they're hungry enough, they'll eat. There's 
there's numerous reasons why people starve, but if my body doesn't want it and I'm not willing to eat it, I can sit here and I'm not going to do it. And I could be as hungry and my belly could rumble and I'm not going to do it. Mm. And neither is your kid. Yeah. If your kid you do what you need to do. Yeah. Help, let's help figure out how we can expand that so your dinner times are not so hard. I would say the immediate um, answer I would have for that is um, I, for kiddos who really struggle with dinner time, I encourage a bedtime snack. I say, look, let's see what we can do about getting some calories in before your kiddo goes to bed. And I encourage parents to avoid um, what I call, um, uh, you know, kids' favorites. So don't say, oh, what would you like before you go to bed? You take mm -hmm. the opportunity to say, hey, it's time for a bedtime snack. You offer it to everybody who's there at home. And maybe it's a couple of ounces of milk and a couple of peanut butter crackers or a small serving of yogurt or a little bowl of cereal or something. So you know your kiddo is going to bed with some nutrition in their tummy. And you just make that routine. If dinner time is, is bad news, then I just think that having, um, I, have, I had a family call that last call. It's last call, everybody come and have a little something before you go to bed. And I think um, like Rebecca, you wanna be sure you're getting that nutrition into your kiddo. And Rebecca and I can sort of help on the other parts, right? Uh, okay. I would, I would add that, um, especially for dinner time, what I hear from a lot of families is children are really tired. Mm -hmm. um, and when they're really tired, they're not gonna cooperate well. They don't read their own body um, feelings and sensations well. They are grumpy and they don't even know it. And the more tired they get, the more grumpy they get. So if you begin to see a pattern that dinner time is your big struggle and you feel like you're not able to get your child to eat what you think he needs nutritionally, maybe think about a later afternoon kind of um, opportunity to eat with a smaller portion at dinner and on the plate, I, this is another thing I think we do, we over um, serve the plate. So I would say, put a small amount on the plate because you can add more, put one thing on that plate that you know the child will eat. Um, if, if they always want a cookie, put half of a cookie on the plate and then put a little bit of whatever the rest of the family's eating so that they have options. They don't have to hold you hostage. And you just have to rethink what's the timing of the day that's going to work best for this child right now developmentally. Harriet, that's a really, really good point. Dinner time is prime meltdown time for everybody. Kids are losing it. Parents are, you know, it's pushing their parents' buttons. I love the idea of dinner being a smaller meal. Have a nice big snack. Have just a little bite to eat, right? Do what you can to make dinner pleasant right. for everybody. Right. And then a make food, all yeah. that up. A food battle you'll live with forever. It'll exactly. just change its course from time to time. And you don't want to start that process at a young age. Yeah. Okay. I just want to let you know that it's 7.04. We, have, we do have, uh, looks like four questions left, but two of them might just be comments. So I don't know if you want to finish up or um, I'm, I'm happy to, to go whichever way you want. I have a couple of more minutes, maybe two or three more minutes. Okay. Um, the, the, one of the two questions, if wanting your child to explore different, uh, different way of, of a food that they eat, should a food chain be used like yogurt drink to yogurt? You could certainly try it because um, mm -hmm. you could try like, I mean, there's not really like a, I think you would be just be changing like the thickness almost in that sense. If you're going from like a yogurt drink, like uh, one of those like Danimal smoothie kind of things, it's really just kind of thinned out yogurt in a cup. So you could try, you know, are they willing to pour it in a cup instead of the Danimal's thing? Could you put it in a bowl? Could you thicken it a little bit so it's closer to that yogurt in a cup consistency by putting a scoop of yogurt, like the same kind of yogurt if you've got vanilla animals and vanilla animals or whatever it is and thickening a little bit so you're progressing in that same path. And then as you get thicker, can you do the, the thicker vanilla or thinned out a little bit? Can you drink it with a straw? Can you kind of mixing it up that way? And then once you've got those different textures or flavor, like 
consistencies rather, then you can work on like different flavors. Or if you just have vanilla, can they mix in strawberries that they really enjoy? Or can you blend up strawberries together and put those in, kind of mixing it up that way? Okay. And my six-year-old son says he doesn't like eating because it's boring. Any strategies to keep him on task and eating so it's not a two-hour long struggle to eat four nuggets? Mm. Hmm. So Rebecca, that's, I, that's <laughs> I was gonna say I've done things in my sessions where, you know, sometimes it is, it does take so long because the kid's not interested. And, you know thinking about what foods are being presented. Are they things that are, you know, harder to chew or harder to manage? It sounds like chicken nuggets maybe is not that, um, but maybe it is harder for your child to manage and it is too much at the end of the day. Maybe they truly are just too bored being at the table. Um, they make things like game plates um, where you can kind of move things around on the plate. I've made like little games in our sessions where, you know, how can you make it more fun for your child? How can we keep them more engaged at the table? That's kind of like, where can we help with those mealtime routines to kind of make it so that, you know, your child is willing and able to tolerate being at the table with you for that, you know, 20 minutes. Because truthfully, kids at the, at the dinner table, you've got like 20, 25, maybe 30 minutes. Like, and then you've really tapped out because then you get into like conversation about the day and that's, it's no longer the meal time. But I feel like sometimes we still expect the kids to be at that table and to hold hold still that long. And at the end of a long day, it's it's a big ask. And so it's hard. So sometimes just considering that piece as well. But okay. I think we have reached the end. And you have an opportunity here to see the different ways that you can connect with both Rebecca and Karen Mountjoy. And if anybody um doesn't have access to this by tomorrow, you can certainly reach out to the community relations office and, and we'll connect you with, with both. Um, and I, oops, I'm sorry. I'd like to do a quick plug here. Um, sure. at York hospital pediatrics. We have not only myself on our feeding team, but we also have two lovely speech therapists. Um, and we collaborate really closely together, um, and can really work hand in hand. And a lot of the things that OT can do um, that I covered today are a lot of things that a speech therapist can also do. So um, please feel free to reach out and fax referrals over um, or to reach out. That's my my hospital email here. Um, but if we don't have a way to get you in with me um, or you know another therapist has the availability, um, just know that we have a good solid team here of some therapists that are skilled in feeding. Um, so if you just see a different name pop up when you get a referral, or when you um, schedule for a session, that may be why, but we have a lovely team that works together here. Great. Karen, do you have anything to add or Harriet? <laughs> just just a reminder, you, you're not going to find me at York Hospital. You have to find me at my office. And so both my phone number and my, uh, oh, my email is there. So if there's anything I can do to be helpful, please don't hesitate to reach out. Um, so that's all. I just want to thank you both for participating. you you make my job easier. <laughs> um, and it takes a village, right? <laughs> so Harriet, it was it was really a pleasure to chat with you and Rebecca today. I ask me again. I'd love to do it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I know that we did have to cut it a little bit short and there may have been more questions um, with the folks that are still with us. Feel free to send them to the um, info at your hospital address. We will make sure that Harriet, Rebecca and Karen get them and we will be sure that they are answered in the link that you are sent in a few days once the video is up on our YouTube channel. Um, I think that's it. Oh, there was one other item. You will also be receiving a very comprehensive snack list um, as kind of a, a thank you for, for joining us this evening that uh, the three of them came up with and it hopefully will be very helpful for, for you and your kids. Uh, and again, that will be on the email as well. So thank you for all for joining us and enjoy the rest of your evening and the snow tomorrow. Thanks so much. Thank you. Bye-bye now.